United States has executed 1,350 men and women since 1977. That makes us a member of a small club of countries where convicted criminals are systematically put to death. That club is getting smaller every year. The most active members today include China, Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. Not exactly countries which share our values about democracy and human rights. But here's a curious thing about the 1,000-plus people killed by judicial order in America in the last three decades. They died after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty violated the Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. That historic ruling came in 1972, but it wasn't the end of the story. In 1976, the Supreme Court reversed itself in a new set of rulings, and the killings began once more. So why did the court change its mind? Does it mean the death penalty is now legally untouchable? And what does the roller coaster approach to justice tell us about the role of the Supreme Court in America? Professor Evan Mandery, chair of the Department of Criminal Justice at John Jay College, explores these questions in a fascinating new book, A Wild Justice, The Death and Resurrection of Capital Punishment in America. He's with us today on Criminal Justice Matters. And to join us in a discussion of these issues raised by the book, we're also pleased to welcome Jesse Wegman, a member of the New York Times editorial board whose beat is the criminal justice system. Welcome to you both. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Evan, let me start with you. After the first Supreme Court decision in 1972, Chief Justice Warren Burger said there will never be another execution in the United States. What happened? Well, all of the justices clearly believed that, that it was over. Um, I guess to answer that question, you have to go back uh, a little bit to understand how they got there in the first place and forward. Uh, the back is um, Potter Stewart and Byron White, Byron White reached a, a compromise that decided Furman. Uh, and the compromise was that the death penalty was going to be struck down because of how it was applied. And it left an opening for states to be able to respond by rewriting their statutes. When you say Furman, that's Furman v. Georgia, which right. was the, the initial case, case in 1972. Yeah. So we have this idea, and most people have this idea, of justices in the Supreme Court making um, decisions for all time in their black robes, august decisions. But three of the justices, even after their reversal, changed their minds again. So what does this tell us about how politics influences court, the court, how, does, how the court works? Right. Are we missing something when we're sitting out there? Well, I hope it tells us that, uh, and I don't think this is a very surprising conclusion, that judges are human beings who decide cases based on their social standing and their mood and their uh, political attitudes, what's going on in their life, and they feel differently about different things at different times. Uh, if anything, I feel like my book is, um, my investment in the project is more to tell a realistic story about how Supreme Court cases are litigated uh, and decided, and I hope we can begin to have an honest conversation instead of, uh, pretending that law is made and, uh, you know, preordained by God and divined by, uh, you know, priests. All right. Well, we'll get a little bit into how the court operates a little further in the program, but let's go back to capital punishment for a second. One of the questions I asked at the outset of the program is, as a result of the reversals, whether the death penalty is now legally untouchable. Is it? Well, uh, it's touchable. It's probably, as a practical matter, that's probably more a political question than a legal question. As a political matter, it's probably very difficult uh, for Greg to be challenged. Um, I think that the lesson that the court took from the history I tell, for better or worse, is that the court really can't run very far ahead of public opinion. And I think even if uh, I drew a direct link following um, the gay marriage cases, I think the way the court handled that was basically reflected that judgment that the court the court can't push too much effectively. Okay, you mentioned that dirty word, politics. So let me let me turn to Jesse for a second. Um, we don't often think of politics in connection with the Supreme Court, but clearly a lot of the decisions that the court has made over the last 10, 15, 20 years, starting with the reversals, have all been, had political dimensions to them. Um, we often think of the court, we'd like to think of the court as a liberal or conservative court, and I wonder really whether those adjectives really apply. After all, some of the attorneys general um, who uh, argued against and for the death penalty, you couldn't divide them between, uh, between liberal and conservative. Is it fair to call a court liberal or conservative? And where are we at now? Well, the justices certainly don't think it's fair. Um, I think mm -hmm. it probably is in, in the broader sweep of things. Um, I think it's hard. It can be hard on a case-by-case on case case basis because, uh, as Evan's saying, um, these decisions come down to so many different factors. But I, 
I do think, you know, obviously um, the Warren court was different from the Rehnquist court, was different from the Roberts court, um, and the makeup of the justices, their, their um, you know, the, the presidents who nominated them, the, the, their ideological bent um, that we gather from their speeches and from their writings. I think really does have an impact. I, I don't think there's any question. I mean, we're about just that. beginning a new term. We're about to begin a new term on the court. Um, obviously, a whole new set of players, a whole new um, cast of characters, uh, and it's obviously hard to prognosticate. But I'm wondering whether you think we get the same ruling today uh, from this court as we did in 1976 when they reversed the original rulings. It's a good question. I, I mean, the court, you know, the term started last week. There have been a few, already a few pretty um, high-profile arguments on uh, campaign finance and then uh, and on um, affirmative action. And you know, I was I was at those arguments, and and in both cases, it was it was quite striking how you know how the justices divided by the way we normally classify them politically. You know the. Uh, the liberal justices um, in the affirmative action case went right after the, you know, the state for for banning affirmative action, whereas the conservative justices went after the people who um, wanted to keep affirmative action. So, mm -hmm. it was pretty clear right away that that the split that we generally identify on the court, you know, for conservatives, for liberals, and Anthony Kennedy in the middle, is uh, is alive and well. Whether that would um, have any impact today in a death penalty case. Um, you know, obviously, death penalty cases come before the court all the time, uh, but not uh, not in not at the level of a Furman v. Georgia or Greg v. Georgia. They're they're s smaller questions, uh, or I shouldn't call them smaller questions. They involve somebody's large, life, large but they involve questions that don't go to the heart of whether or not the death penalty is constitutional. Evan, what would you say? Would would we have the same ruling today from today's court? Well, I'm a gambler, so I like questions like this, and I'd like to bet on it. Uh, I would bet against the court taking uh, a blanket challenge uh, to the constitutionality of the death penalty. But if they were forced to consider the case, uh, my bet would be you have you have four four as as Jesse just said, but my bet would be that Kennedy would vote to strike the death penalty down based on his opinions in other cases. On what grounds? On cruel and unusual punishment? Yeah, um, well, you have to understand in the context of this history, cruel and unusual. The cases weren't really decided. Nobody said that it's a cruel and cruel punishment across the board. That wasn't the basis for the ruling in Furman. It was really the problem with its application. Um, I think Kennedy would base it on the growing trend in states moving against the use of capital punishment. That's the recurrent theme in death penalty litigation, that the movement is away from using it. Well, that's one of the interesting things that happened and that you actually talk about in your book, that shortly after, literally almost immediately right, after right. You the, had the first opposite. decision. Yeah, you had the opposite trend. <laughs> right, but you had 24 states within the next 10 years, in 1974, uh, passing death penalty statutes. Well, you had uh, post Furman, uh, within a three-year period, period, 37 states passed new death penalty statutes. It's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But I talk about in the book, I, I don't necessarily think that was an expression of support for capital punishment so, was, so much as it was a repudiation of the court invading something that states felt was their province to decide. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if we had, I mean, the, the original decision was taken before we knew about DNA, which was DNA science developed. Right. Now that we know, as a result of DNA, the dangers of executing innocent men, or innocent people, uh, would that have impacted, do you think, on the original decision, if we knew that? Well, um, the relevance in a, in a constitutional sense of the DNA evidence is that it's moved to public opinion. Um, and so if you look at the decrease, and it's been sub substantial over the past 10 years in support for capital punishment, I really believe, and there's lots of research on this, um, it's not provable, but it's, uh, you can draw a pretty strong inference that it's the case, that uh, people's concern with error has really driven uh, the decline in support for capital punishment. Ironically, in 1976, uh, after Furman and then after Gregg, support for the death penalty surged to all-time highs. Uh, before, before 80 percent. Yeah, yeah, before Furman, yeah. Um, there was actually less than uh, a majority of the population, 49 percent in the last poll before Furman supported the death penalty. Immediately post Gregg at 66 percent, it spikes at 80, as you uh, pointed out. And I believe that what's driving that is that people believed the Supreme Court had fixed the arbitrariness of capital punishment, so they thought they had regularized the system. Um, so DNA evidence would have clearly made a difference in people's belief about whether the death penalty was being effectively and properly used, and that in turn, I think, would have uh, emboldened and supported the justices of the court who wanted to strike down the death penalty. But there's also another 
argument that you raise in your book, which is that um, trying to figure out the reasons for the court's reversal, the, the decision that was made on capital punishment in 1972 was almost an easier target than a lot of the other decisions the court had made in the years since. Roe v. Wade, right. number of decisions that were unpopular but had majority support in the court. So this, as, you, as Evan said, made it easier to go after the Furman ruling on, ca on capital punishment because it seemed vulnerable. But it says a lot about the dynamics of how people actually think of the court and the public's hostility towards the court and its supposed intrusion into American life. It seems to be what, what drove a lot of the objections and a lot of the political feelings against the court. I wonder, is that still true today? And how, how big of a factor do you think that has been and, and remains in how we assess the court? Well, I think Evan, Evan did a great job at, at articulating why the reaction to Furman was so much stronger than, say, to Brown versus Board of Education or Roe v. Wade. Brown was 9-0, Roe v. Wade, I think, was 7-2, and Furman was 5-4, and it wasn't just 5-4, it was a completely disastrous 5-4. There were hundreds of pages of opinions. Nobody agreed on anything, even within the, 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 the two sides. And I think, as Evan uh, pointed out, that really opened the door to a sort of public uh, it made it easier for the public to to uh, resist it um, politically uh, as they saw the justices were doing among themselves. I think when you look at, say, mm -hmm. cases like that today, Bush v. Gore, Citizens United, where, the, where it is a very fractious court, 5-4 uh, rulings, um, you, you see that same kind of response. There's an immediate reaction, immediate public reaction. All the news, uh, you know, newspapers and the media say nobody trusts the court anymore. And really, you know, I think what's happening in each of these cases is you do have a, a legitimate dispute on the court. They did not agree, and that's being reflected in, in public opinion. Where does the court stand today in public opinion, you think? First you and then him. Um, I mean, I think a lot is made of how their uh, standing is lower than it's been um, in in decades. I think it's it's still higher than Congress and the president, <laughs> but that's not very difficult to do. Um, and uh, you're asking where is it going from here? I, I mean, it's hard to say. I think these things are. Um, I think it's hard to to. to um, pull out real trends uh, that are that se separate from the sorts of major rulings that the court makes. So we don't know. Depends on what sorts of rulings are coming in the future. Okay, Evan, very briefly. Uh, I think the justices perceive their responsibility to the institution in the same way, which is to preserve the public's confidence. They have to only they can't run too far ahead of the public. They only have to act where there's a broad consensus. Okay, we've got a really interesting term coming up, and I want to thank you both for giving us a sort of bird's eye view of what we might expect in the next couple of months. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. Thank you. Back in 1972, Dorothy Beasley defended Georgia's death penalty statute before the Supreme Court and lost. She's had a stellar legal career since then as chief judge of Georgia's Court of Appeals and later as a noted international jurist, where her assignments included work with the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Today, she's a senior judge of the state of Georgia. Judge Beasley, we're honored to have you with us at Criminal Justice Matters, and Evan, thanks for staying on. Thank you. So, Dorothy, you were Assistant Deputy General. You were 34 years old. You were appearing before the court in one of the most dramatic, historic cases of the 20th century, as Evan called it. And you were a woman. There weren't that many women appearing before the court at that time. And Justice Harry Blackman, in his notes, called you a nice girl. Uh, how did that feel to appear? Tell us a little bit about what it felt like to appear before the well, number court. one, I didn't know that's what he referred <laughs> to course. me as. Um, but I don't think we recognize the seriousness, well, the seriousness, yes, but the historic significance of it, that it would go on for so long afterwards. I don't think we really understood that as much. I was the only one up there. Nobody else went with me to, jo to the Supreme Court. So it was the most, as I said, lonely experience I've ever had because you're there, you can't stop the camera, and there are nine people who meant nine men, nine old men, who well know what the case is about. And you've got to persuade them to the way that you're representing. It's quite an awesome experience. You, I mean, you lost the case, although yeah. some might say that eventually the case won itself. Well, you know, it's it. interesting you say that. Yes, we did in a way, 
but the death penalty was not really ended at that time. Yes. And we keep saying they got rid of the death penalty. They really didn't. They said, you can't do it the way you're doing it. And when we saw Justice Powell that night, Charles Allen Wright and I did, and he said, I don't know what the opinion means. You're going to have to figure that out. And so that is when we, actually it was um, Attorney General Derryberry, <clears throat> Meyer Derryberry of, of um, Oklahoma, and a bunch of us gathered out there to figure out what we were going to do because there was no real discussion about, okay, we won't have the death penalty anymore. That was not the discussion at all. And really, it isn't now, mm -hmm. if you look at it, mm -hmm. because it seems to me, especially after reading Evan's book, that the justices were making policy. The Constitution says cruel and unusual punishment. It doesn't say don't murder. It doesn't say don't horse whip. It doesn't say put in stocks. Don't do that. The founders didn't want to say what not to do, but they put two adjectives. And that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. To say it's not cruel and not unusual, that's two things. But did, you, did you get a sense that when the, the judges were listening to your argument that they were, they already had their minds made up or that they're actually ready to listen to one point of view or the other? How balanced did you feel that? I thought that they were very open. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that is the case anymore because they started writing long before we argued and they came with their own ideas. And that's one thing I think that the American public should understand, at least that I see, and that is that they're only really representing their own view in a way and their own view of the law. Mm -hmm. And this kind of a subject is, I think they really put it back in the public. And what I think is one of the wonderful things that came out of that is yeah. that the discussion is continuing on. Because what they did is put in that Eighth Amendment, the Bill of Rights, something that says to the whole world, this country stands for not cruel and unusual punishment. When you think, they didn't tell us what it was. And so when, you know, the National Cathedral has a law window, and it says, that the law is the witness and external deposit of our moral life. And in the book it's shown, the judges are thinking about the moral aspect of it. It doesn't say in the Constitution it has to be moral. It doesn't say it has to be fair. It doesn't have to be just. But that's what has to be so, included in it. And the mm -hmm. economics of it. Where does that tell us, uh, what does that tell us about how the Supreme Court institutionally acts? Let me bring this up to you. Evan, because you have a lot of fascinating things to say about the inner dynamics of the court. One of the things I learned was that judges, justices don't, don't necessarily just decide, don't only decide what cases they're going to hear, but what questions they're going to actually rule on. I want to say two preliminary mm -hmm. things. One is, uh, in writing my book, I got to meet dozens of people I never would have gotten to meet in my life, mm -hmm. and it was the most incredible learning experience of my life. But I made two friends out of it. <laughs> and um, Judge Beasley, Dorothy, opened her I'm house in the Adirondacks uh, to me and my family, and it was really, really nice. So I've thought about what it must have been like for her to argue the case. And of course, a lot of the things that you say, I only know because I've been able to read through the judges, the justices' archives and talk to their law clerks, but she didn't have that experience going in. And I just imagine that, you know, being a 30-something attorney at that point, um, you just must feel terrible. Well, talking to the law folks <laughs> is, how, is how you got a lot of the information to begin with, which is fascinating. Right. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my book. Uh, you know, in, in The Brethren and Woodward and Armstrong's book about the Supreme, about the Burger Court, they talk to the law clerks, but it's all off the record. Everything in my book with one fact is on the record. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't understand why it's not exploited more as a uh, font of uh, information about the court. But, uh, but, but what you said is clearly true, but she couldn't have known it in her situation. She couldn't have known whose vote was up for grabs. We know now Byron White's vote was up for grabs. But that's it. But their there's no way she up, could have known the, that. The vote is up for grabs. That they're actually having a conference yep. midway through the decision mm -hmm. where they actually talk about this stuff at lunch. Who, who knew that mm -hmm. there's actually the same kinds of negotiations and horse trading going on as we'd see in Congress? Right. Um, well, even if uh, a litigant knew that that went on, they wouldn't know the content of that conversation, of so they wouldn't be able to, they, it's very, I mean, lawyers strategize about this, right? They speculate about whose votes may be open, um, but, but they're left to guess. Let's and go it, back to some of the issues that, one issue that Dorothy was raising about the role of the court in American life. I want to read you 
um, part of the uh, statement that Robert Bork made in 1976 mm -hmm. when he was appearing before the court. And he said, this case, the death penalty cases he was talking about, is merely the latest in a continuing series seeking to obtain from this court a political judgment, a political judgment that the opponents of the death penalty have been unable to obtain from the political branches of government. Now, uh, Bork's argument won out, apparently, uh, in 1976, but it raises the question about whether the philosophy of some justices that the court should not supersede the decisions and the, the uh, approach of elected legislatures, mm -hmm. or whether it should stand as the arbiter, as to bring Americans, bring the law closer to what we think are the standards of decency or moral standards of our society. Where do you come down on that? I mean, where, what is the role of judicial review? It's the last place to go. These questions that have been around for centuries, ever since we've kept history, is the same questions, Cain and Abel, you know? And so it, it should be discussed and decided among the people by the elected legislators, in our country anyway, so that there is a debate. What was going on in the Supreme Court was a debate, but it was almost stovepipe. It was with their own law clerks. There was not much discussion, and they were taking into account a lot of evidence that was not in the record. They were doing their own studies. That's what should go on among the people. As we have now, there are statements being made by various churches. You know, our own Lutheran church has a whole sta social statement on the death penalty. It means it's, it's being discussed among people. It should be in civic organizations. Do we want it or not? So to me, the question is, should we have it? Not is it constitutional anymore? I think we're beyond that. Because so as we see, well, b entirely. because it shows that the justice system can't handle it. We've tried all kinds of different ways, and we can't get it perfect enough to know that, number one, somebody is being executed wrongly because they didn't commit the crime, or that there is too long a delay, 9, 10, 16 years. Mm -hmm. Billy Neal Moore was on death row for 16 and a half years. 13 times. And then, of course, issues of racism. <clears throat> All of that. We can't get rid of those things to make it perfect enough to do something like take somebody's life. And that, in our way of thinking, morally, is the worst possible punishment. That doesn't even take into account. We don't think of torture, for example. Mm -hmm. But that's another aspect of it, too, is as our country looks at it. We are signatories to a number of treaties. And just you mentioned the UN uh, Tribunal for Rwanda. All of those tribunals which we support are the United Nations. They don't have the death penalty. And we're part of that. So a person like Charles Taylor, his conviction was just uh, affirmed on appeal, responsible for the killing of thousands and thousands of people, he can't get the death penalty. And yet somebody in this country that mm -hmm. maybe killed one person can get the death let me let me close by asking you each a very quick question. It's not an easy question, and it's hard to answer in a shorthand. But which is more important for the health of a criminal justice or a justice system? Letting an innocent, ensuring an innocent man goes free, or ensuring a convicted man goes free? Oh, the risk of convicting an innocent person is substantially more significant than the risk of uh, allowing a guilty person to go free. Well, what this shows, too, is, is that our whole system is askew because that's this one penalty. But you can take that across the board and find the same problems with every other one. But the consequences here of taking a life right. is what's driving the debate, and it's a very good debate to, sh to show how we need to change things. For example, now we're moving much more to restorative justice. And that well, was not then, and I think that's what the founders had in mind, is to, to see how it's seen as time goes on. Well, that's Chris for a whole other discussion. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Abolishing the death penalty isn't high on our list of national priorities these days. That's not surprising. According to a recent report from the Death Penalty Information Center, just 2% of counties are responsible for the majority of U.S. executions. Places like Harris County in Texas or St. Louis County in Missouri. The fact is, 85% of American counties haven't had a single execution in over 45 years. 
and crime has been going down across the country. So, do we still need to belong to the world's most grisly club? Let me know what you think. I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.